to Hotel Bar Sessions, the podcast where three philosophers sit down at the end of a long conference day to chop it up at the hotel bar, which, as we all know, is where the real philosophy happens. Welcome back to another episode of Hotel Bar Sessions. My name is Lee Johnson, and I'm here with my co-host, Rick Lee and Jason Reed. Today we are talking about Descartes' second meditation, the cogito ergo sum. But before we get to that, let's get some drink orders and some rants and raves. So Jason, let me start with you. I'm going to have, I believe it's a Brixton lager. Anyways, I'm going to have the kind of lager they serve in British pubs. <laughs> you know, it's a great beer. It doesn't really call attention to itself, and it's not very strong in alcohol content. It's there to be sipped while you chat with your mates, as they say. About the cogito? Or, or anything else. And I'm going to rave about conferences. <laughs> I mean, we make a lot of jokes about conferences, about comments that are supposed to be questions or questions that are really just comments, <laughs> and about traveling to talk to four other people, half of whom are your co-panelists, and all the various ways in which conferences can go wrong. And there are a lot of issues to be raised about the travel, the ecological effect of conferences, oh, yeah. and making them more accessible. But I have to say that when a conference goes well... When you are around other people who are interested and interesting and want to talk about some of the same things, it really goes well. And I just came back from HM London and got to connect with some people I haven't seen since the COVID years, people from the UK and all over Europe. And it was just a good reminder of why we sometimes do this crazy thing of traveling to talk to a bunch of other people and lose sleep and all that other sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, what about you? What are you drinking and what are you ranting or raving about? I am going to have a Hemingway daiquiri. So I was wait, 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 what's that? A Hemingway daiquiri. It's a regular daiquiri except with grapefruit juice. Ooh. Very refreshing. So... I was all set up to rave this week until the Supreme Court denied an appeal in the case Michael Johnson versus Susan Prentice. This is a case in which there is a prisoner, Michael Johnson, in solitary confinement, and his prison was not allowing him to have the mandated recreational periods outside. And so this prisoner has been months on end in a small solitary confinement cell without a window and has gone months and months and months at a time without ever seeing daylight. Ugh. So Justice Katanji Jackson Brown wrote a wonderful dissent in this. And of course, all the other usual suspects signed on her dissent. And this is just an outrage beyond any outrage that I could imagine. Lee, what about you? What are you drinking and are you ranting or raving? I think I'm just going to have two fingers of whiskey to close out this season. And, you know, I wasn't really sure if I was ranting or raving, but I think I'm just going to go ahead and commit to a rave about an event that's happening in February that's called the Florida Man Games. <laughs> So I just recently learned about this, and it looks amazing. I mean, I really think I might have to attend this. Let me just tell you some of the events. There is the weaponized pool noodle mud duel, the <laughs> evading arrest <laughs> obstacle course. There is a catalytic converter, four bikes, and a handful of copper pipes race against time. And then, of course, the one that we're all waiting for, the Beer Belly Florida Sumo. So this is happening in February of 2024. Get your tickets now for the first Florida Man Games. So today, speaking of Florida Man, we're talking about Descartes' second meditation. <laughs> Rick, what did you want to talk about? Well, I think there's perhaps no more famous statement in the history of philosophy than René Descartes' I think, therefore, I am. This is a conclusion he reaches in the second of his meditations on first philosophy, and it's seen as one of the crowning achievements of modern philosophy, or at least that kind of philosophy that is usually called rationalism. In fact, the claim can be said to be the founding moment of a trajectory in philosophy that goes from Descartes through Spinoza and Leibniz, Kant and Hegel, all the way into Edmund Husserl's phenomenology, if not beyond. 
It's also been the target of a great deal of criticism. Some people insist that it's the origin of a dualism of mind and body. Others insist that it is the founding moment of a subjectivity that's set over and against the material world. And others point to the class antagonism that is contained in the very statement itself. Enrique Dussel goes so far as to insist that before there is the ego cogito, the I think, there is the ego conquero, the I conquer. But what does Descartes actually argue in this founding text? How does he conclude that I exist as long as I am thinking? And what consequences does he draw? So let's bring Descartes into the bar and ask him, Rene, what the fuck? <laughs> So, Rick, I know you're jumping out of your seat in this episode because you are always currently teaching Descartes' meditations. <laughs> but I don't think that we can assume that everybody listening knows what this text is or what it's about or how we even get to the second meditation. So could you give us a little context for this first? Yeah. So Descartes tells us in the preface to this text that he started to get worried that he believes and holds as true a lot of things that turn out to be false. And so he says that he thought once in his life he should turn his attention to figuring out how he could stop accepting as true that which turns out to be false. So the first meditation takes this question head on. He comes up with a principle that as long as he doesn't accept anything as true, then he could never go wrong. He tries to figure out what things he shouldn't accept as true, and he decides that if there's the least possible doubt that can be raised, he should treat that thing as if it's false. Then he has to decide what can he doubt and he goes through a series of increasing stages. I can't accept the truth brought to me by my senses because they have deceived me. But then that leaves a whole lot of truths. And then he says, well, but sometimes I've been dreaming and I thought that was real. And then I wake up and find out it wasn't real. And so a whole nother set of truths can be doubted. And then he finally comes up with the most radical and profound form of doubt. What if there's a being that's something like God, all powerful, and yet is doing nothing else in the universe except making it that I go wrong? This is what normally is called the evil genius. In this case, if there is an evil genius, then I have to doubt everything. And the first meditation ends there. And it might be worth pointing out here that when Rick says meditations, he, he is talking about a book. The book is called The Meditations. That's right. The chapters are how we refer to the first meditation, the second meditation, etc. And right. I should point out that these meditations, according to the conceit of the text, each one takes place on a different day. Right. And so the whole thing seems as if it takes place on six subsequent days. Clearly, Descartes wrote this not on six subsequent days, but that's the conceit of the text. And that first day was a doozy. The first was a doozy. <laughs> and by the way, before we move on, I think this is one of the fascinating things about the text is that unlike many texts in the history of philosophy, maybe with the exception of Plato before him and Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy, this text has a narrative. Like stuff happens in the text. He gets up, he goes by the fire, he looks out the window, he tells us what he's wearing or not wearing. <laughs> and so this is a text that actually actually has a story and a narrative and a plot to it. Mm -hmm. So on the second day, he wakes up and he is now really anxious because he has to doubt everything. He sets himself anew to the task of finding out whether he could discover at least one truth he can accept as true without having to fear that he's doubting. He really then just starts reflecting on the fact that he is doubting. And really early on in the meditations, he says, well, wait a second. If I'm doubting, then I exist. If I didn't exist, then I wouldn't be doubting. The very doubt itself is a demonstration that I exist. And then he says, well, what about the evil genius? Well, if the evil genius is deceiving me, then again, I exist. This leads him to recognize that as long as I'm doing 
any activity that he lumps under the category thinking, and these include activities like judging, knowing, willing, willing that not, imagining, and even sensing, as long as I'm engaged in these activities, I can be assured that I am. And so then we get the famous statement, I think, and as long as I am thinking, I am, or I think, therefore, I am. That's the simple version of the argument. So before we go on, let me ask you all, do you find this compelling? Well, one thing I want to bring up, which I think is interesting, is that in the meditations, the formulation is, I am, I exist, is necessarily true every time I utter it or conceive it in my mind. Mm -hmm. It's in the discourse on method that we get the famous, I think, therefore, I am. You know, Descartes wrote this, like, popularization of his own method in there, and that's where you get the conjunction, right? It's interesting that he says that every time I think or conceive I exist, it must necessarily be true. It's like a self-evident proposition. And the I think, therefore, I am. I mean, it's a weirdly famous statement because you sometimes see it in cartoons about philosophy. Like, oh, here's a philosophical thing to say, I think, therefore, I am. But it's not that profound unless you're familiar with the moment of radical doubt that pre-exists it. It only has a kind of profundity in the sense that Descartes has thrown out everything, right? My senses must be doubted. Everything I know is uncertain. What's this Archimedean point I can find? And it is that even when you're doubting something, there must be something that doubts. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I wish that the popularized version of this was, what is it, dubito, uh, ergo sum, <laughs> right? Like, yes. So cogito means I think, dubito means I doubt. Right. And I completely agree with Jason that it is in the doubting that the existence of at least his mind is affirmed or secured. But I can't imagine that that same confidence would have come with any other kind of thinking. I'm going to push back a little bit on this for two reasons. The first reason is because Descartes lists doubting as one of the ways in which this thing he calls thinking happens. And so I doubt, therefore I am, is the same as I think, therefore I am, because doubting is a kind of thinking. The second reason is because he then goes on to recognize that all these other forms of thinking, willing, willing that not, judging, imagining, sensing, all of these are like doubting in that if it is happening, then I am. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know that there would be a big difference if he simply said, I doubt, therefore I am. Because I think given that, he could expand it and say, I sense, therefore I am, I will, therefore I am, I imagine, therefore I am. All of those are equally true. But don't you think that all of those other forms of thinking would be covered by the suspicions that attend to sometimes what's called the malevolent god or the evil genius that's deceiving me? I mean, it seems to me that I could be deceived that I'm willing or deceived that I'm imagining, but there's something about doubting that's different. I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, I want to simply say what's different, Yeah. but let me put it this way. How would it be the case that I could be deceived that I am willing? Willing is a little bit difficult because it seems like what he's worried about is the object of my knowledge might not exist. Therefore, I could be deceived that the object of my knowledge exists. But I could know something, and even if it doesn't exist, I'm still, in a sense, knowing it, or knowing is a bad example here. I could will something, and even if the thing doesn't exist, I could still will it. I can imagine something, and clearly, if it doesn't exist, I can still imagine it. I can sense something, and even if it doesn't exist, it still nevertheless is the case that I am sensing it. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit of a callback to our episode on the simulation hypothesis, but there, you may remember, I proposed my sad Pac-Man theory, <laughs> and this seems to me to be an example of a way that I could be deceived into thinking that I'm willing. So Pac-Man thinks that Pac-Man is deciding that he's going to eat these ghosts and gobble these cherries and run around this maze, but he in fact is not willing any of those things. Now, you might say, well, Pac-Man, just by believing that he is willing those things, nevertheless is assured of his existence. But I mean, I think today, knowing what we know about virtual realities, we might say that's not an assurance that he is existing. 
the question is not really about whether I will, therefore I am, is a valid consequence. That is, if the I am follows from the I will. It seems like you're raising more a question about the fact that there is no such thing as a will. Okay, fair enough. Descartes would insist that if I'm willing something, I'm willing it, and I cannot be wrong that I'm willing it. Well, I'm putting aside for the moment whether or not we can will things, because I might disagree with that last statement. I was making that point to just try to answer your question, what is different about doubting? And I think that's what's different about doubting than willing or imagining. It seems difficult for me to fold doubting into the deception that the evil genius might be implanting in me. Is the question that doubting presupposes some kind of agency? Is that it? Yes. That there yes. is a active component to doubting? Doubting supposes a distinction between the doubter and the thing doubted. Yeah, I get that. I guess what I was trying to say was a different point, that one of the things that frustrates me about this quoted phrase is taken out of context, as they say, it's banal, right? It only really has a philosophical weight to it when you recognize that Descartes has said that everything I know and think has to be cast into doubt. What is the one thing that can't be cast into doubt, right? I think, therefore, I am just seems like it doesn't have the weight without the doubt. But it is interesting to think that the doubting, it almost has a dialectical function. Yeah, I can yeah. negate everything, but I cannot negate the thing that is negating. Right. And that seems to me about doubt, right. right? Like that I can negate everything except for the fact that there is negation going on. That's a dubito ergo sum. There are two issues here. One is whether according to Descartes, doubting is significantly different than willing. And then the second is whether we agree with him and we want to separate doubting from willing. And I say this because the whole method of the meditations plays on the fact that the problem is assent. That is, things present themselves to me as if they are true. That's not in itself a problem. The problem is that I assent to some of them that then turn out to be false. Mm -hmm. According to Descartes, doubting is holding as if false. But for Descartes, the doubting itself is an activity of will. That is, I cannot doubt without something like will that could hold what is given to me as true as if it were false. Mm. Mm -hmm. Really what underpins this entire operation is the will itself. The will is the most fundamental thing, I think, in this entire text, because without it, I don't have any ability to doubt or assent for that matter. And it ties back into what we were saying earlier about the meditation, the days. I mean, he constantly says these things like, oh, I've gone back into my old habits. I've fallen back into believing in things. You know, I have to remind myself of what it is that I've founded in this method. And there is a sense of the will up against a kind of errancy that's fundamental to our experience, right? This constant thing of being duped or being irresolute and falling back into old habits of mind is what Descartes is struggling against. It is interesting to think about the difference between trying to determine if something is true and trying to determine if something is indubitable, because the second obviously still involves my will, as you were saying. Yeah, that's right. I think what's interesting to follow Jason's point is that frequently in the third meditation, it comes up again in the fourth meditation, another time in the sixth meditation, he'll say, just as you said, Jason, I keep falling back into my old habits of thought, and I have to be careful here. I have to proceed slowly. I have to make sure that I'm on firm ground. And he'll frequently then go back to this moment of the cogito emerging and say, okay, I got to start there and remember what I'm doubting and what I'm not doubting and move forward from there. So, Rick, you haven't answered the question if you find this argument compelling. To the extent that we just stop at, as he says later in the second meditation, as long as I am thinking, it is true that I am. If we just stop there, I find that incredibly compelling, but maybe, as Jason said, a little bit banal. Mm. I think where Descartes starts to get into a bit of trouble already in the second meditation is when he then says, okay, I know that I exist, but what am I? He then makes the leap to say, 
well, because I know that I am when I'm thinking, then I'm a thinking thing. Mm -hmm. There is where I find the argument less compelling. I also think that what is not frequently pointed out, although Husserl does in his Cartesian meditations, is that this is the first moment of a kind of argument that one doesn't really find previously in the history of philosophy, namely what philosophers call a transcendental argument. Mm -hmm. Descartes says, okay, thinking is going on, of that I'm sure. Now, what are the conditions for the possibility of that? Yeah, And so he finds then that that I am is the condition for the possibility of my thinking. It doesn't follow from the fact that I'm thinking because in a way it's prior to my thinking. And, you know, as I said before, and I think this is a phrase that Husserl uses, I am follows along every act of thinking in which I'm engaged so that whenever it happens, there I am. <laughs> and that is a remarkably new kind of argument that one doesn't find in the Middle Ages, one doesn't find it in Aristotle, at least not in the way that it is made here. And it's that form of argument that will then have rippling effects through the history of philosophy. <laughs> Did you know that Hotel Bar Podcast is more than just a podcast? We are a fully online, cross-brand, synergy platform of content creation. Actually, that's not true. Those words are meaningless. But you can follow us on the app formerly known as Twitter at Hotel Bar Podcast. There you can find the handles of all the co-hosts as well. You can follow us all or pick your favorite. If by the time you hear this, Elon Musk has burned down the servers to collect the insurance... You can also find us on Facebook or YouTube. Just look for Hotel Bar Sessions. Wherever you find us on social media, you can contact us with ideas, complaints, and questions. You can also email us anytime at hotelbarpodcast at gmail.com or visit our interactive page at hotelbarpodcast.com. No matter how you get in contact with us, we're always glad to hear from you. So, Rick, in the last segment, you said that where Descartes goes next after declaring every time he thinks he is, that must mean that he is a thinking thing. Now, that seems like a pretty big leap, and I'm not really sure, and I imagine most of our listeners are not really sure what that even means, a thinking thing. Right. So can you kind of draw those connections between those two points for us? Let me first point out that Descartes sent this text, The Meditations on First Philosophy, to one of his friends, and he said, you know, you're friends with a bunch of philosophers out there. Send this out, and I'd like to get their responses to this. And so frequently when this text is published, it's published with a set of objections and Descartes replies to these objections. And one of the philosophers that this guy, his name is Marin Mersin, sends it to is Thomas Hobbes, the author of The Leviathan. This is before Hobbes published The Leviathan, and he was famous as a natural philosopher. He pushes exactly on this point, and Hobbes says, okay, you are, and you say you're a thinking thing, but how do you know that that thing which is thinking is not just a body, like that thinking is a capacity of your body? And the way that Descartes gets there is he says, okay, first, what I mean by thinking are a number of different types of thinking, and he, throughout the meditations, gives several lists of those types. Here, they are doubting, understanding, affirming, negating, willing, willing that not, imagining, and sensing. Descartes says all of this seems way more amorphous and abstract than this microphone in front of my face right here, right now. <laughs> so why am I saying that I am so sure that I am a thinking thing when it seems way less sure than the things that appear to my senses? And this is when he raises the example of a piece of wax. So could you please set the scene? Set the scene. <laughs> Well, here's one of those moments where, you know, we're sitting in Descartes' dressing room with him. There's a fire going. Obviously, there's a candle. He has a piece of wax. 
and you know it has the odor of bees. Well, it smells like honey, not the odor of bees. That's- <laughs> 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 what do you think bees smell like? That's how I describe honey, as having the odor of bees. Bees smell like honey. <laughs> like, I have not smelled a bee. I don't get that close to them. <laughs> they sting. I'm just saying, I feel like we're imputing something about bees that I'm not comfortable with. I don't want Big Bee angry at the podcast. <laughs> it smells like honey. <laughs> Big honey, call us. Suddenly, by the end of the podcast, my face is swollen <laughs> because I've been stung multiple times by Big Bee. Um, all right, it has the odor of honey, <laughs> and it has the taste of honey, and if I thump it, it makes a sound, and it has a more or less definite shape. Okay, it's malleable, but it has a more or less definite shape. So all of that seems really clear that, you know, okay, that's evident about what the wax is. Until I, Descartes, stand up and bring the wax closer to the fire, and then all of a sudden it loses its shape. In fact, it goes through many changes of shape and potentially infinite changes of shape. It actually gets bigger as it melts, like the volume of it gets bigger. And through all these changes, it's still wax. And Descartes wonders, how then am I sure that it's still wax? And his answer is, it appears to my thinking only. That all of this stuff that appears to my senses is in fact much less certain because of its changeability than what appears about the wax to my thinking. Mm -hmm. And so the appearance of things to my senses actually falls back on the fact that I am thinking because it's the thinking that really gets at what the wax is. I'm more certain about the wax in thinking than I am in vision. And now I'm back where I started. I am a thinking thing. And that is more sure to me than the fact that I am sensing. Sorry, see, this is difficult. Not the fact that I am sensing. It is more clear to me than the wax that is given to me by means of my senses. Right. And I need to make that clarification because sensing is one of these things that I can never doubt that I'm sensing when I'm sensing. I can doubt whether the thing I'm sensing exists, but I can't doubt that I'm sensing when I'm sensing. Yeah, can we talk about how, in some sense, Descartes has really stacked the deck by picking a piece of wax? (laughs) I mean, he says in the same meditation that he doesn't want to be fooled by the way people commonly speak. He doesn't want language to stand in for thought, right? And he's happened to pick, and I guess this must be as true in 17th century Latin of the philosophers as it is true in 21st century common everyday speech, that you use the same word, wax, to talk about the hard and the liquid version of the thing in question. There are other things for which we have different words. You know, had he had an ice cube, Mm -hmm. I'm sure an ice cube would be hard to come by in 17th century. But anyways, had he had an ice cube (laughs) and he put it by the fire, he would have had to say, now it's water. Or gas. Or gas, eventually, right. I don't blame him for picking a great example of the thing he wants to say, which is that something can vary immensely in terms of all of its perceivable qualities, smell, touch, etc., and still be the same thing. But I just want to point out that there are only a few examples where we would use the same word for that radical Mm. shift of properties. But wouldn't it have to be the case not only that we use a different word— but that we are not sure that water and ice are the same thing. Right. So I might see water and call it water and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden I see a chunk of, you know, this square thing. And I'm like, I don't know what that's called. I'm going to call it ice. And I don't know what its relationship to water is. That might seem hard to believe because you could probably see ice melting and you could see that there is a relationship. But Lee, your point about the steam, the gas, is the more difficult one because why should I say that the steam is the water rather than saying it just gets turned into air, something completely different? Mm -hmm. That's a much more difficult one. But if you did understand the connection between steam and water and ice, that connection would appear only to your thinking. Yeah. Yes. Oh, good point. Oh, wow. I kind of disproved my, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I kind of worked against myself there. Jason, are you near a trauma center? Because you need a burn unit. (laughs) No, but I still hold that it's debatable. I mean, the water example is really good. It's debatable if we would call these the same thing. Ice, water, 
steam. You know, they're called phase shifts in physics, and there's a whole discussion of solids, liquids, gases. There's a whole thing about that. It's unclear if we would think that they're the same thing. I think that Descartes has stacked the deck in that he has picked something we don't have different words for. I mean, we might add the adjective hot wax, etc. We don't have different words for it. Thus, he has made it so it seems like oh my God, yes, the sensory properties of things can shift in all kinds of radical ways, and we only have this thing that we think of as the remaining thing. But for a lot of other things out in the world, the sensory properties don't shift in so many ways. Or if they do, we call it something else. I don't disagree with you that Descartes was a genius in choosing wax as his example, because it is so clearly useful in making his point. But I want to get to something that a lot of scholars have noted over the years, which is that Descartes seems to be upsetting the classical notion of thinking. So in particular, Aristotle's notion of thinking. And here's the reason why I want to point that out is because obviously in the examples that we're just talking about now, so water, wax, you could even use a human being. I know that a human being is a human being if it's an infant or if it's an old person, clearly we know that because we're identifying what Aristotle would have called essential properties Mm -hmm. and not accidental properties. Now, what's interesting is that Descartes is distinguishing himself, I think, and Rick, please do correct me here because this is your domain, but distinguishing himself from more classical views, which didn't separate all of these different ways of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. So for Aristotle, I mean, thinking is a lot of things. It's nutritive, it's locomotive, you know, in addition to being rational. But Descartes seems to be, I don't know, like reducing thinking to just the rational part, just the thing that, for example, could tell the difference between an accidental property and an essential property. Is that right? Yeah, that plus will. So the rational part plus will. But well, first of all, I think in Aristotle, there isn't really a notion of will. But I agree with you that there is a shift here in how thinking is characterized in Descartes. And you're right that for Descartes, the essential properties of something certainly are thinkable, but that's not the only thing that belongs to thinking. There are other things that belong to thinking. And I think Descartes moves away from essence, and he tends to use the word idea more than he does essence, so that the idea of the wax is something that I am certain of when I'm not certain about the thing that's appearing in front of me, whether that's wax or not. Mm -hmm. I can have the idea and give a definition of wax, whether there's any wax in the world at all or not. And so I think, Lee, another way to put this, and this is another deck stacking, is that Descartes considers only those things to be thinking, which can be isolated from the world in which the thinking happens. And I would argue that for Aristotle, at least, for example, in the De Anima, thinking is always within the context of the world. And one thinks the world and the world responds insofar as it's thinkable. And there's an interaction between self and world there. But notice that doubting, understanding, affirming, negating, willing, willing that not, imagining, all of these things can happen in complete isolation from the world. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, Descartes has already assumed what in a way he wants to demonstrate, or if one wants to think about this more positively, that's the result of the fact that I've gotten to this moment only through doubt, which has cut me off from the world. Mm -hmm. That in the face of the evil genius, as he puts it, here I am alone in the world, Mm -hmm. right? No, he can't even say that. Here I am all alone and I am worldless. Yeah, and it's very hard to think of a thinking thing worldless. Yes. A thinking thing alone. That's right. Because what's his thinking about? (laughs) Right. I think Wittgenstein made this point at one point that thinking is a verb that sometimes functions without an object and that he can say, I think, without saying what he's thinking is part of this separation, right? Because usually you think of having to think something, but for Descartes, thinking kind of stands on its own. It's worth pointing out that at one point Descartes in the meditation says, I'm a thinking thing, but what am I? 
oh, maybe I'm a rational animal. But he's like, oh, but then I have to talk about what is rational and what is animal. This is the thing that makes Descartes really modern, where he's like, I don't want to deal with anything from the past. Mm. I don't want to presuppose anything. I want to start completely anew with this idea of what is the thing that remains when you decide to doubt everything that existed before, and that is the act of doubting itself, this Archimedean point, you know, one point that could move the whole world from. The Archimedean point can't be on the world. You can't move the earth from a point on the earth. You have to separate yourself from the world to act on the world. Right. And that's an analogy, the Archimedes analogy he brings up in the second meditation. Yeah. Yeah. I think that this is the moment in which he's modern, except he takes over from medieval thinkers that we can point to the origin of many of these claims. For example, William of Ockham already makes a distinction between an act of understanding and an act of assenting, Mm -hmm. so that I can understand something without assenting to whether it's true or not. That Descartes picks up from medieval philosophers. Also, Descartes operates with a principle that one finds in Duns Scotus, so this might be a little complex, but it's basically a simple idea that of two things— If I am sure of one and doubtful of the other, then those two things are necessarily distinct. Descartes relies on this to insist that my mind is not my body, because I am sure that I am a thinking thing while I'm doubting that I am a body thing, and therefore those two things must be different. That he borrows completely from the Middle Ages, and so I often like to point out that there's something important about his self-proclamation of starting afresh, given the fact that he obviously does not start afresh. We need to figure out, why is he invested in this? I'm starting new. I'm starting from scratch. I'm looking for the Archimedean point, and I don't care about Aristotle. I don't care about scholastic philosophy and so on. So, yeah, he's a modern, but like most moderns, a self-proclaimed modern. I mean, I think this is a really interesting and important question and something that, again, may not be obvious to listeners who are not trained in philosophy or the history of ideas. So maybe we should just take a moment to explain, like, what's going on in the Enlightenment? What Mm. is distinguishing this period from the medieval period and the classical period before? And why is it so important to start afresh? One thing that has to be pointed out is that Descartes is writing this after the Protestant Reformation, and I think more importantly, after the Thirty Years' War, in which Europe came to blows over the question of religion and ultimately decided that the religion of the prince will be the religion of the people— The effect of this was to break any authority that the Catholic Church had on philosophy, which was practiced in universities, which were under the Church's jurisdiction. And so now philosophers like Descartes, like Hobbes, and many others of the period are thinking without any kind of authority that used to ground much of the thinking— including then the authority of previous thinkers like Aristotle. I mean, in the Middle Ages, if you could say this is the argument Aristotle makes, then everyone's like, well, then I guess it's true. It must be true. (laughs) Well, we call him the philosopher, so it must be true. And so the step that the Enlightenment makes is to start thinking out from under the yoke of authority. To borrow a phrase that Kant will use, it's a kind of coming to maturity that is I'm not like a child and I do whatever my mom says. I mean, although I still do, Um, (laughs) but I'm mature now and I'm thinking for myself, as it were. That's really crucial to place in its historical context to figure out why it is Descartes is making these claims to novelty when, of course, he's obviously not novel as much as he thinks he is. Yeah, and before we get too excited about these triumphs of the modern Mm -hmm. period, let's also remember that this thinking anew also gave us some pretty terrible things, some pretty terrible ideas about other races, about the division of the humanities, about what constitutes a state, what constitutes a rational person. I mean, this is not just the age of enlightenment. This is also the age of colonialism and dispossession and many other terrible things besides 
many people, rightly or wrongly, point at Descartes. They point at the cogito as the beginning of this. And a lot of that is because we get from Descartes in the second meditation, the isolated, worldless, thinking thing Mm -hmm. that is looking upon the world and intending to not only understand it, not only find what's true in it, but move it. That's exactly right. But that move it, not only think about it, but also move it, points to this notion that I raised in the introduction from Enrique Dussel, namely that before I'm a thinking thing, I'm first a conquering thing. Yeah. And that's one of the ways in which the world is moved. And it's only on the basis of having already been a conquering thing that I can then be a thinking thing. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I do think that a lot of the way in which Descartes is blamed for a lot is kind of a weird distortion of Descartes in many ways. I mean, he says, I'm a thing that thinks, right? Right. I mean, there are histories of this. The idea of a subject merges later in Kant and in Hegel and later gets retroactively posited back to Descartes. One of the many things that Descartes is blamed for is mind-body dualism. But as we've kind of joked before, it's also the only text in which... Descartes tells you what he's wearing, where he's sitting. It's a very (laughs) embodied text. No one else – I mean, I've read a lot of history of philosophy, and I've never gotten that many invocations of what people are wearing. Or what the wax smells like. Machiavelli (laughs) talks about changing into his nice clothes for the books. That's the only other example I could think of of a dress code. And I raise the example of Plato, where you do get descriptions of maybe not what people are wearing, but what their hair looks like and who's beautiful and who's not beautiful. And then Boethius's consolation again. But I think your point is well taken. I mean, these are relatively few examples of philosophers in, you know, the 2,500 years or more of the history of philosophy in the West that you find such embodied philosophy. Here at the hotel bar... Rick, Jason, and I like to pour philosophy straight into your ears. We're an independent and ad-free podcast, and we'd like to keep it that way. But the only way we can do that is with listener support. You can help us defray some of our production costs by signing up to support us on Patreon at patreon.com backslash hotel bar sessions. There are several levels of monthly donations there that you can sign up for, and every one of them helps us keep raising our glasses to deep conversations. If you'd prefer to make a one-time donation or several one-time donations, just visit our website at hotelbarpodcast.com where you can find links to support the podcast through Venmo, PayPal, or Cash App, and you can keep enjoying our tipsy philosophy and sobering insights. I'd like to return, if I can, to Lee's point about Descartes, I think, is not just thinking the world, but is moving the world. Because that opens on to a lot of criticisms that have been made of Descartes' philosophy subsequent to his philosophy. I'd like to start this by pointing out what Jason was just referring to at the end of the last segment— Namely, we know an awful lot about what Descartes' wearing and where he is. And as I often tell my students, this is like a moment in The Big Lebowski when the actual Big Lebowski says to the dude, you go out dressed like this on a weekend? Have you no job? I mean, so Descartes has six days where he's basically in his room. Mm -hmm. And if you pull a transcendental argument on that— What are the conditions for the possibility of Descartes being in his room for six days? It turns out that he needs to have leisure time, and that leisure time is paid for by someone. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's a lot of production going on to make it possible for Descartes to be unproductive for six days. And also to make it possible for Descartes to literally doubt some things. On separate occasions, I've heard both Charles Mills and Lucius Outlaw, so I'm not sure which one of them is the origin of this idea, but make the point that, you know, a slave 
in the 1800s does not doubt the existence of other people. He mm -hmm. does not look, yes. you know, out at people walking by and say, maybe they're just hats and coats walking by. Right. Because the separating from his or her embodied existence in the world is just not a possibility. Yeah. There's a Latin American philosopher named Santiago Castro Gomez who has written a book, I think it's translated as Zero Point Hubris. And he points out, I think, Lee, exactly what you're saying here, namely that Descartes acts as if he's thinking from nowhere. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. as we've said, he produces a position in which he's worldless. But Castro Gomez wants to say, you're not thinking from nowhere, first of all. And second, because you're in your dressing room in, I can't remember if he's in the Netherlands when he's writing this or in France, you're in a specific place, but your ability to treat that as if it's a no place is based on the fact that you have already conquered and enslaved a number of people who can make your place seem like it's no place. Mm -hmm. On that note, in the Discourse on Method, he says this about his living conditions. He says, and it is exactly eight years ago that this desire made me resolve to take my leave of all those places where I might have acquaintances and to retire here to a country where the long duration of the war has led to the establishment of such well-ordered discipline that the armies quartered here seem to serve only to make one enjoy the fruits of peace with even more greater security. And where in the midst of a crowd of a great and very busy people who are more concerned with their own affairs than they are curious about those of others, I've been able, without lacking any of the many to be found in the most bustling cities, to live as solitary and as withdrawn a life as I could in the remotest deserts. And I always think that passage is interesting because there he gives a kind of sociological account of the cogito, right? He says, look, the thing about a city is like there are people, so I get everything I need. I got my dressing gown. I get my wax, <laughs> fresh wax when I need it. All the stuff I need, I can get. But the people who are getting the stuff don't meddle in my affairs because I'm just another person at the wax store, right? They're just <laughs> trying to sell me the wax and get me moving on. And like you said, I'm not sure where he's exactly he's talking about there, if it's Paris or wherever, but it's in the emerging cities of Europe that he finds the social conditions where you can have everything you need and be disconnected from everyone who provides that for you. Mm. My guess is that he's in the Netherlands, given the reference to yeah. the ravages of the war, and he's right. referring there to the Thirty Years' War, in which he was basically a mercenary soldier. Most of his income, as far as I understand, initially came from his being a soldier for hire during that war. But your point is, I think, right. He has a certain economic position within a society that is urban and therefore not concerned with with other people and gives him the freedom to be unconcerned in return and to concern mm -hmm. himself only with finding this Archimedean point in which he then becomes worldless for real in a way. Yeah, and I do think that for better or worse, this is the inheritance of the Cartesian cogito that we have carried well into the 21st century is that what a real thinker is, is one that can separate themselves from the body, from the whims of the populace, from everything that might interfere with the willing thinking thing and just proclaim things. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, isn't that what a computer is? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting because just last night I was having a drink with my mom and her husband. And because of our bizarre academic schedule, I taught my last course of the term yesterday. And I won't teach a course again until after the new year. They said, oh, you know, it'll be nice to have all that time off. And I said, well, it's not really time off because I've promised these two essays and I have to prepare my classes for the next term. But, and these words came out of my mouth, it will be nice to have that uninterrupted time mm. when I can turn my thoughts to my work. And this is a callback to Talia from the episode on trans philosophy I'm saying I don't want to get out of the house because that gets in the way of my thinking. And I think that's the Cartesian inheritance, that the work of philosophy is best done alone, quietly, in your room, without any interruptions. Hopefully, though, you have clothes on. <laughs> or the fire's warm enough. I think everyone should have clothes on at all times. Well, <laughs> I'm not going to judge. Right, right. In the privacy of your own home. Same. <laughs> 
Well, you guys, this has been a fantastic conversation. It is also the last conversation of our eighth season. So congratulations to all of us for making it through another season. And we really do want to thank our listeners for sticking with us. You know, we've really gone sort of soup to nuts here this season on our topics. And I'm looking forward to next season. Well, and we're already hard at work on next season. If we could only get some uninterrupted time (laughs) to turn our attention to the important work of podcasting. Exactly. I'm just going to go be another girl at the wax shop. <laughs> <laughs> co-host down, co-host down, we lost Rick. So, so stay tuned. Next season we'll have movies, we'll have philosophy, we'll have pop culture, we'll find philosophy in the most unlikely places and in all the places you expect to find it. <laughs> Dude, listen to this guy. I'm not taking him home. Jason, he's on you. Oh, no, no.